Okay, um, today we are talking about liturgy and biblical wor worship. I probably should put this in the other order because I'm going to get a liturgy late uh, in our conversation. It's about um, biblical worship and liturgy. And I first want to get into a few of the things we've talked about already, uh, particularly last time we met. We talked about what is worship, and we said that as Christians we believe worship is a set of culturally embedded and corporate practices. Now we said earlier that worship is, is communion with God. It is when God calls us and we respond to that call. We've talked about worship being both remembrance and anticipation. It is remembering what God has done in the past. It is looking forward to anticipating what God will do in the future. And we reflect that in our various liturgical practices. You guys dancing back there? Is there something going on I need to know about? Um, Some things you don't need to know about. Uh, so, with the understanding that it is both God's calling to us in relationship and us responding to Him in relationship, that it is remembering what He has done and looking forward to what He will do. Um, that's, excuse me. I have a cold. I actually got a cold on this trip. Um, that in very sort of practical sense, you know, apart from the theological descriptions we have, it's a, a set of culturally embedded in corporate practices through which God forms us into the likeness of Christ to become more Christ-like, which means to be more holy, to be more what he desires for us to be, that we do, we worship in and through the story of Jesus Christ. It is Christocentric, to use a good uh, theological word. Christocentric means it is centered on Christ. That it is by the power of the Holy Spirit and in order that we might live our lives to the glory of God. This is all sort of an expanded practical understanding of what worship is when we say that it is God calling us, us responding to Him, that it is a remembrance of past and anticipation of future. And then the last time we met we talked about varying styles of worship to the various ways that Protestant worship, at least, has come to be and the, the kind of uh, historical background. And um, I'm going to throw all these up here. I didn't know that I still had this open up. <coughs> that the worship styles or styles of spirituality, because this is more than just what you do. It has to do also with your, our understanding, our understanding of our relationship with God. That there was the Puritan New England church which was the clearest incarnation of the Reformation expression on, of the word in the New World, the, the focus on the word. The free church style, uh, the Anabaptists, which were the Mennonites and Brethren, you know, it's, it's amazing to me how these three classes which sound so different, Christian ethics, um, worship, and uh, the Christian apologetics too, how we're, we're still interweaving. We're talking about the Anabaptists and Mennonites this morning. The radical understanding of, uh, different understanding of uh, church worship, uh, revivalism, that began in Europe but moved to the U.S. and became an American church style where the liturgical elements all tended to focus on prompting a conversion. You know, the preaching of sin and the calling to conversion, the whole tent revival movement across the South that I, I grew up with, and the idea of an altar call, that the whole focus being the revival, the conversion. Then the Christian nurture movement, which was a reaction against revivalism, which advocated bringing people up, and the young people up in the faith, rather than necessarily converting them. Like a friend of mine who was an Anglican once said, you know, we need to focus more on bringing them up rather than just bringing them in. Well, revivalism focused on bringing them in, into, the, into belief that is, and the nurture movement focused on bringing them up, raising them in the, in the faith. And then Pentecostalism, the most influential worship style of the 20th century, focused on freedom of lay-led worship, a call to decision, expressions of the presence of the Holy Spirit through especially the ecstatic gifts of the Spirit. Now, in terms of the specific pieces of these, um, again, I'm going to throw them all up there. The New England Puritan worship involved very, fairly simple blessing, starting with a blessing and then a hymn, scripture, sermon, prayer, occasional communion, once a month or once every quarter even, and then a hymn and blessing, pretty straightforward, but the thing about the New England worship is the sermon could, would take over an hour, and often the pastoral prayer would take over an hour. So you're looking at three plus hours of service, even though it doesn't look like there's a whole lot going on there. The mainline Protestant worship, which is based upon the pre-church movement, call to worship, confession, hymn, creed, and or scripture, sermon, prayer, communion, hymn, blessing, or sending. That probably sounds familiar. Most mainline churches have that, and we have those elements in our Presbyterian church. 
The revivalist movement, again, very simple, focus on the, call, the, the revival effort to save souls, prayer, a praise, which usually was congregational singing, a testimony, because people sharing their own experience of either salvation or renewal in Christ, a sermon, which focused upon sin and the need for redemption, and then an invitation, what was sometimes in the early days called the harvest of souls. Um, it would have things like the, the anxious bench, down front, there would be a row of pews or, or seats where people who really felt God calling them and really struggling with it would come forward and somebody would pray with them, etc. 20th century seeker service, which especially was made popular by uh, Willow Creek, uh, the, the uh, complete blank, um, Saddleback churches and a number of the other kinds of churches like that that are very seeker oriented, meaning people who don't know. Okay, so they don't use a lot of... Um, of Christian language, they try to make it something that someone who doesn't know, who's not church uh, educated, who doesn't know the church, doesn't know the Christian faith, will be comfortable with. So a welcome and prayer, a praise time with uh, worship songs, and they often, that's where we really started calling the singing time worship, as opposed to the rest of the service, which is not referred to as worship necessarily, but the worship time is when you're singing. A presentation, which could be a drama, film clip, something to relate to somebody who's not from church, a sermon or a talk, sometimes they'll even say. Um, invitation to come, either to come to Christ or to get involved in the church, the life of the church, the activities of the church. And then Pentecostalism. Uh, Pentecostalism has it's had three major waves. The third wave, I'm really sorry this is cut off. We need to figure out if we can figure out how to fix that. Because, no, not right now, but later. Um, but it's probably still the computer. Yeah. yeah, whatever we need to do, because I, you know, it, I, I move stuff up and have room, and it still doesn't show up. The, the third way Pentecostalism was the Vineyard Fellowship, uh, particularly John Wimber and people associated with the, the more recent, like since the 70s kind of Pentecostalism. The original Pentecostalism goes back to the first decade of the, of the 20th century. And then there was a, the charismatic renewal, would hap, which happened in the middle of the 20th century, where the Pentecostal expression of the ecstatic gifts of the Spirit and other elements spread out into other churches, Catholic and others. And then the most recent would be the fellowship um, charismatic churches, like the Vineyard Fellowship. And they, John Wimber developed invitation, which is a call to worship, engagement, an approach to God, exaltation, a recognition of God's transcendence, adoration, an acknowledgement of God's imminence, and then intimacy, resting in God's presence. All of this is an effort to try to pursue intimacy with God. Those are Wimber's words. And so you start out focusing on the people, the congregation, and you, you then begin to approach God in the engagement. You focus on exalting God for his greatness in the exaltation phase, and then you move toward feeling a sense of God's imminence or closeness that he is our loving God, he is our savior, not just our Lord and King, which is the exaltation. And then, all, and then you begin, you, you get quieter in that last part to the point of resting in God, the intimacy phase. And so the whole thing, all of the service there is, it is oriented toward intimacy with God and really creating an environment where that intimacy can happen. So different traditions, different historical developments, different orders of worship that reflect the priorities of be it revivalism, free church, Pentecostalism, whatever. Um, that's all stuff we've talked about before, but in each case, I want us to have kind of those backgrounds. The contemporary situation um, has developed so that by the end of the 20th century, there really are three major kinds of uh, worship services being done. The first are those that make the strongest attempt to connect with the culture around them. This is the, the seeker, you know, they want to reach out into the community, that they're the that includes the seeker services, some of the other kinds of services that are very uh, outreach oriented into the community, and they tend to be much more music oriented. You know, they're the ones that will focus on the music, will, fo will have non-churchy kind of things like film clips or drama or uh, liturgical dance, things of that sort, that people who aren't necessarily church people would be able to connect with and appreciate and enjoy and therefore be drawn in. So. So they're the ones that are most wanting to be able to draw people from the culture in. The second, those who stand out as distinct from um, any influence, I still haven't fixed that, any influence from contemporary culture are close to the historic worship patterns that are, they will emphasize how they're different from culture. Those are, especially the Eucharistic. The, the ministers there tend to wear robes, they tend to be very formal, 
they're not concerned about somebody coming in and not being comfortable because they don't know what's going on. They typically, they, there's an expectation that the people know when to stand up and when to sit down, that they know how to follow along. Uh, because it, so they're not looking to try to bring somebody in from outside who doesn't understand this and make them comfortable with it. The Anglican churches would be an example of that. Orthodox churches in America and elsewhere would be an example. They tend to be more Eucharistic or table oriented. That is the table, of the communion table. Um, and then the third, those in the center, have both an interest in preserving the ancient patterns of worship, but also seeking to be obedient and helping transform the culture. They're trying to bridge that gap. Um, we talk about blended services, all right? those that want to be more contemporary but also maintain historic. That's very much what our uh, Presbyterian church does. Those churches tend to be more word-oriented. So the first one, the seeker, the seeker church kinds of thing, the seeker-oriented, will be much more music-focused. The historical, Anglican, more formal kinds of settings, uh, where the liturgy is a higher form of liturgy, will be table-focused, more the Eucharist is the primary event, and that's why they will have Eucharist, the communion at every service, not just once a month or once a quarter. If you go to an Anglican church, like a Catholic church, they will have communion every week, every time they meet. Um, and then the, the, the ones that try to bridge the gap are more word-oriented. The focus is on the reading of Scripture, upon the preaching, now, some word-oriented word churches, this would be true for Baptist churches and things, uh, they, they will emphasize the word to the extent that they put the pulpit in the middle. All right? If you are involved in a Eucharist or table-oriented church, Anglican, etc., you'll never find the pulpit in the middle. The focus will be on the communion table, or the altar table, as it's often called. Altar, originally, of course, in the Old Testament, was the place where they sacrificed animals as a central act of worship. Later on, it came to symbolize in the Catholic Church the, the reenactment of the sacrifice of Christ. The Catholic Mass is a re-sacrifice of Jesus. You know, and it's the, so the body and blood is then shared with people. So it is still an altar table. In Protestant circles, we'll refer to it as an altar table because we especially take serious Paul's words that we are to present ourselves as a living sacrifice. And so the altar table, as we have here, is a representative not of animal sacrifice or of re-sacrificing Jesus, but rather that it is the place that we bring ourselves as a sacrifice to Christ. Um, and you know, so we're, you know, we as the Presbyterian Church are very much word-oriented, but we have the pulpit on the side because we want, to, you know, we want the cross and the altar table in the center and the pulpit on the side. Calvin, for instance, who was the founder of Presbyterianism, you know, of, of, of Reformed theology, um, he wanted so much to focus on the word that he did put the pulpit in the middle. So even though most Presbyterian churches now have it on the side, uh, Calvin himself, the founder of Reformed Theology on which we're based, he wanted to focus on the word so much that he insisted on getting rid of the altar table and putting the pulpit in the middle. And so you walk into a church, depending upon where the pulpit is, will tell you something about what kind of church they are. Some of their theology as well as what their focus of worship is. Okay? Questions about any of that? That's all background. I mean, that's, that's, what, that's stuff we've done before. Um, Scratch your head, I'll call on you, Chris. Um, okay. So, based on all that, um, again, we ask the question, what is worship? I mean, I keep coming back to that because it's easy for us to come up with answers, but are the answers that we have, in fact, is the worship that we practice real worship? Or do we need to ask that question of ourselves? John Stott said, and I quote, Christians believe that true worship is the highest and noblest activity of which man, by the grace of God, is capable. And I think stop, include women in that as well. That it is the highest thing we can do. It is the highest and noblest of all activities. Is it always in our churches? There's a tendency today for people, and there's been a renewal in, in, in worship in recent years, and I think that renewal is continuing. Part of that renewal is for people are beginning to be open to discovering other aspects of worship that other traditions have had. That's one of the reasons why I have dealt with the different traditions, is for us to recognize that the, what we think of as normative, in other words, what we think is normal, what we think is the way you do it, may not be the only way to do it. And we may be missing out on a lot. I told you last week that two recent developments in, uh, in late 20th century, well, in 20th century, since the 1960s, um, have really changed things. One of them is the Catholic spiritual renewal following uh, Vatican II. 
early in the 20th century, a, a priest in Europe was really pushing and kicking, Spanish priest, for more lay, or in, um, lay involvement in worship. And that eventually, through many other things, led to, in the 1960s, the Second Vatican Council. And the Second Vatican Council, while it did many things, including insisted that the, the, mass, the Catholic Mass is, involved, is presented in the people's language so that they can understand it. It's not in Latin anymore. There are some that still practice it in Latin, but mostly it's in the language of the people. That the lay people, the, the general congregation, is now much more involved in worship. That led to more of an academic focus on what worship is and what, what the Catholic theology is. It led to the development of a whole, almost a generation of Catholic spiritual writers, Henri Nouwen, Thomas Merton, etc., who were not only influential in the Catholic Church, but were greatly influential in the Protestant churches. And in fact, other practices like the, you know, the Walking the Labyrinth, which I know Lynn has been involved in, and the Tays community, which is an ecumenical community in Europe, um, a Tays spirituality and a style of worship that crosses those boundaries. The Catholic renewal following the, uh, during and following the Vatican II has greatly influenced Protestants as well. And so there has been and continues to be something of a renewal as we begin to discover traditions outside our own. And for Protestants, that includes finding traditions of worship and spirituality out of the Catholic Church, where we are growing in our sense of what it means for us to pursue intimacy with God. And so that's why we're talking a lot about that. But I think one of the things that we have to be prepared to do is to ask, is the way we're doing it now in need of reform? Is everything that we do that we call worship really worship? I quote A.W. Tozer. Uh, if, you, if you don't know Tozer, he was a um, um, great Bible scholar. He's written a lot on prayer, on spiritual things. Tozer said this. Well, first, after Tozer says that there has been such, in his time, uh, such a spread of Bible societies and Bible translations and Bible commentaries, he said, Christians today, and this is first half of the 20th century, Christians today know more about, the, they have more of the right answers they are theologically better trained than at any time, any generation of Christians before. But, at the same time we have more of the right answers, do we really know what it means to worship anymore? And he says this, I wonder if there was ever a time when true spiritual worship was at a lower ebb. To great sections of the church, the art of worship has been lost entirely. And in its place has come that strange and foreign thing called the program. This word has been borrowed from the stage and applied with sad wisdom to the type of public service which now passes for worship among us. Now it's true that anybody who's responsible for planning a worship service in a church, you have to think about what pieces are going to go in there. You know, when do we have communion? You know, how many songs are we going to sing? What are those songs going to be? Um, what, how often are we going to have communion? I mean, you have to think about the elements and what elements are going to be incorporated. But I know from my own experience in churches, and also my experience working in professional theater for a while, that there are times in which planning a worship service can become very much like planning a variety show, you know. Here's where we get everybody to wake up, okay, or whatever it is. And there should be a difference. There should be some way in which when we talk about worship, we recognize it's not just a program, as Tozer called it, and that we're just coming up with those elements. We need to ask the question, is the worship that we see in churches today, is the worship that we are experiencing, is the worship we're helping to plan in some of our cases, is that really what God would have? Is it genuine worship? And by that I mean, does it, to use Wimper's definition, does it enable us to pursue greater intimacy with God? Or is it just a spectator sport? Okay? It, I've said this before, it's broken my heart a few times, while I mean it as a compliment, when people say, oh, we come here every Sunday to hear you preach. And I'm going, no, no, no. You come here every Sunday to meet God. Spend time with Him. And if you come to our church, you hear me every week say that in this hour of all hours of the week, we are here to worship the Lord our God, to acknowledge Him for His greatness and for having made us and having blessed us and forgiven us and loved us. Okay? You've heard me say that, right? 
That's why we're here. And yet, some people think they're tell, paying me a compliment when they say, oh, we come here to hear you preach. That's not the point. In fact, the, the sir, while you know, we're a Presbyterian church, we're part of the Reformed tradition, and so the word, the reading of the word, the sharing of the word, the preaching of the word, is a foundational part of what our theology, of what we believe. But that's not all of it. And there needs to be worship in song and the confession of our sins and, and all the other elements that we try to incorporate. All of that is part of worship. Worship is not just singing the songs, although that can be a very meaningful part of the worship. So, when we ask the question, what is genuine worship? Is the worship that we are participating in or even helping direct? Is it what God would really have? And I think the, the, to get at the answer to that, we have to start saying, what does the Bible say? What does Scripture tell us about worship? So I want to spend some time today looking at some principles, biblical principles of worship, and looking at some Scripture verses that I think illustrate or give us guidance in those things. All right? And you'll stop me if you have any questions. Uh, yes? What about this uh, thing that they call the gift of the laughter? And uh, uh, I saw a service on, on, on TV, and not only on TV, once uh, you know, there was an event, and just, uh, well, people just start laughing and laughing, and, and uh, what's yeah. the origin of that? Or, uh, I don't know a lot about it. I think that was, there was a movement that came out of Canada that, uh, what was it called? Shoot. The, the, the Montreal Vineyard. Exactly, it yes, is where it started. And they were barking like dogs and all kinds of things like that, saying that that was, that was, you know, God was, the Spirit was inspiring them to do that. Well, most of Christendom has said mm, barking like dogs is, and laughter may be part of that. I don't know. I mean, I, I um, but... Yeah, it was. I'll think of the think of the name of it in a minute. Um, generally speaking, Paul said, and we as Presbyterians hold highly to the idea that things must be done decently and in order. Okay, Paul said that. We maintain that, um, and that that still allows for like expressions of the gifts of the Spirit appropriately done. But Paul said it in the context of expressions of the gifts of the Spirit that if it gets chaotic, if things get out of order, then you're going in the wrong direction. Okay, um, and so that. We would insist on that, and I don't really know how the gift of laughter comes into it. I had a woman come up to me once, and she came up to me after the service. This is several years ago in the old church, and I, I think they were just visiting. But she said, um, she was a huge fan of John Hagee, who has a church in San Antonio. I do not agree with Hagee on almost anything. You know, I... I'm sure he loves Jesus, and, and that's great, and we are brothers in that regard, but theologically, I disagree with virtually everything. He's done a lot with the whole blood moons kind of thing, and prophetic interpretation, and all kinds of stuff that I don't, I don't buy. And that, that people, I can't tell you how many times people have come up to me in church and go, oh, you have to read this book, and I look at it, and it's a John Hagee book, or it's a, you know, some, somebody of that, and there, it's prosperity gospel stuff too, which I really don't agree. And so I say, no, I have way too much to read now, and I really, I'm not going to read that, so you don't need to hand it to me. Um, I just have to. Well, so this woman came up to me and said, I'm a huge fan of, of Hagee's and, uh, and love it. And she said, how do you feel about, uh, about yelling in the church? I said, Hagee, I, re I heard him say one time in church, he said that you cheer at a football game, you should cheer in church. You should cheer God and yell and wave and, you know, and all kinds of stuff. And I went, we're Presbyterians. <laughs> Decently and in order. <clears throat> Paul said, you know, it wasn't Calvin, it wasn't Luther, it wasn't anybody else. It was Paul said that in the church it should be done decently in order. If you want to cheer loud, yell, 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 yell go to a football game. I, that to me, and there may be people who find fulfillment in that, but I, that doesn't work for me. And if it's just laughter for the sake of laughter and saying that's the gift of laughter, uh, somebody have to really convince me about that. Okay? Um, I think that there's a decorum that is appropriate. It doesn't mean you have to be stuck in the mud. It doesn't mean, you know, or you have to be a stick in, old stick in the mud or whatever. Um, th that, but there needs to be some decorum because that's respectful. If we are talking about gaining greater intimacy with God, we are coming in contact with the God of the whole universe, the holy and righteous one. Does that not call for some respect? All right? It doesn't mean 
we can't feel strong emotions. It doesn't mean we can't be excited about that opportunity, but still we have to show respect. Is that fair? Okay, so let's look at some biblical principles of worship. We have one I don't know about this, the gift of laughter. <clears throat> um, first, the first principle, God desires worship. In fact, he commands it. This is not an option for Christians. Um, we are called to worship. Now, the problem we make is that when our worship is not really um, the kind of worship God commands us to, it's not seeking intimacy, relationship, communion with him, but rather when we start focusing on the external. Okay, I showed up, I spent an hour, I didn't sing the songs, I didn't participate in the re responsive reading. A couple times I didn't actually stand up when everybody else did, but I was there, so I get credit, check my box. <laughs> That's not the kind of worship that God commands. In fact, the story of John 4, when Jesus meets the, the Samaritan woman, as he is walking through Samaria on his way from Galilee down to uh, Judea, to Jerusalem, and by the way, interesting sidebar, most Jews would not want see Samaria, um, what, which had been the ancient northern kingdom of Israel, which had been destroyed by the Assyrians, and the people had been taken off into captivity or forcibly intermarried with, with other peoples, so that the Samaritans were seen as half-breeds by proper Jews. The people in the south, Jerusalem and Judea, Judea is where we get the word Jew, because the northern kingdoms, the northern kingdom of Israel, the ten tribes from there were called the lost tribes of Israel. They were lost. Well, what few bits of them remained were intermarried with other people, and they had developed their own kind of heretical version of Judaism. For instance, they had 11 commandments, not 10, because that gave them permission to worship on Mount Gerizim outside uh, the, the city of Samaria. Anyway, Jews and Samaritans did not get along. In fact, so much did they not get along that Jews typically, when they were going between Galilee and Judea, would go all the way over to the Transjordan on the other side of the Jordan River and walk down through Perea on the other side of the Jordan and then cross back to get to Judea rather than the straight line which would take them to, through Samaria because they, they just didn't get along. Well, Jesus walked right through the middle of Samaria. He did not, you know, he, he wasn't bothered by that. So he's in, you know, in Samaria. Samaritan woman is getting water from the well, and he asks her for a drink. And she goes, whoa, dude, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan, you're a man, I'm a woman, you're talking to me? Are you talking to me? She said. And so he started talking with her. And she said to him, well, I know that you Jews worship in Jerusalem at the temple, but we Samaritans worship on Mount Gerizim here, because they had their own temple there, because once the northern and southern kingdoms were split, the people in the north couldn't get to Jerusalem to the temple, so they created their own places of worship. And so that's what that's all about. <coughs> well, she said, I know that the, you know, that there's a Messiah coming and he'll straighten all this out. And Jesus said, the hour's coming, and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for such the, uh, for such the Father seeks to worship him. Now, the point there is, when Jesus started talking about worshiping, she started focusing on the physical, external aspects of worship. Where can you worship? Where do you go? What do you do? It was the external stuff. And Jesus very plainly is saying to her, you know, and then for the Samaritans, we worship on Mount Gerizim, you worship in Jerusalem, we disagree on that. Jesus says, that's not the point. The external form of what you're doing, where you do it, what steps you go through, are really not the point. The point is, what is in your heart? Are you seeking intimacy with God? Are you approaching Him in spirit and in truth? And I'm actually going to spend some time talking about that expression. What does it mean to worship in spirit and truth? And you'll notice in this translation, spirit is lowercase and it doesn't have a, um, a an ad, what's the word I want? Not a, the. Uh, I can't think. What is the, what is the? A and, what? Article. Doesn't have an article in front of it. Thank you. I am tired. I'm sorry. Doesn't have an article in front of it. Uh, I'm going to give you another translation where it does. In the NIV, it does use an article. And it capitalizes spirit. There's a difference there. And both are really accurate. In addition to that, that it's not the external stuff, um, but rather, you know, God commands us to worship him in truth. When Jesus was being tempted in the desert, and the, the devil, one of his three temptations was, if you will fall down and worship me, I will give you all the kingdoms of the earth, which is kind of a dumb thing for the devil to promise, because he only has temporary control, and Jesus was 
God himself, and the devil knew that, and Jesus didn't fall for it. He says, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. So God commands us to worship him. And then in Revelation 19.10, there's a passage in Revelation 19 where John, the apostle, in writing the Revelation, he's seeing all these extraordinary things, and there's an angel of God that is communicating with him. And in, in, in Revelation 19, John says, And I fell down to worship this angel. And the angel said, Get up! What are you doing? Don't worship me. Worship God! Exclamation point. Okay? Um, the commandment is for us to worship God. Now, built into that, is the next point, and that is God alone is to be worshipped. It's very clear throughout all of Scripture that God alone can be worshipped right, rightly, that only He is worthy of. The angels said, don't worship me as an angel. And that's something that down through history, in fact, um, as Christians we believe in spiritual beings. We believe in angels. We believe in demons. Demons being fallen angels, according to Scripture. There is nothing that the demons want more than to confuse humans into thinking they are to be worshipped. I believe, not just I, but I believe, others as well, that the source of all of the other gods throughout history and other religions, etc., are demons that have effectively convinced human beings that they are in some way divine. Now, they're bigger than us, they're more powerful than us, they are spiritual beings, but we are not to worship them. And when we worship false gods, I think often those are demons who take no greater delight than to convince us that they should be worshipped because if we're worshipping them, they're not worshipping God. All right? That's, I, th I believe a lot of the human history of worshipping other deities is based on that. Some greater demons, some lesser demons, but still demons. In Exodus 20, you know, the first part of the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself a graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. In other words, don't worship anything else. The human tendency has been that we build graven images to represent some spiritual being or we have some symbol that represents the stars or the moon or the sun or, you know, the, the mother tree, or the great river, or whatever else it is. And we create an image that we can focus our attention on that. And God very plainly says, no, don't worship anything but me. Just like in Revelation 19, when the angel says, don't worship me, get up. Same thing happened in the book of Acts. After the, you know, Peter and John, there was, there was healing going on, and people were very impressed the people decided that they were two of the Greek gods, that they were Zeus and Apollo, and they wanted to worship them. They go, whoa, 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 get up! I'm sorry, it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, it was Peter and Barnabas, or Paul and Barnabas. Um, not, not Peter, John, that was a different name. Paul and Barnabas, they thought they were Apollo and Zeus, and they wanted to worship them. And they went, no, 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 get up, don't worship us, we're just men like you. The natural tendency of human beings down through history has been anytime we get oppressed, we want to worship whatever it was. And sometimes there are spiritual beings that want to confuse us in those ways. We are to worship no one but God alone. And if that, you know, God desires worship and he commands it. So that means we need to gather for worship. And I'm talking a minute about corporate worship. We need to commit ourselves. Scripture says, forsake not the gathering of yourselves together. Come together for worship. Okay. Um, when we do it, our focus needs to be God, not the music. Oh, I go to that church for the music. Really? Have you ever seen God there? Have you ever met God there? I go to that church because uh, all my friends are there. <laughs> really? You don't go there because God? Because you meet God there? Now that's not to say having good music is bad or meeting your friends there is bad. Those are wonderful things. But is that the point? Are we in effect coming to worship something else? Right? Um, so, God... God desires and commands worship. He alone is to be worshipped. And it is not the structure. It is not the place. It is, in fact, that God is available to us and we should pursue intimacy with Him. The third point, the worship of God is itself a mark of saving faith. All right? 
Paul writes to the Philippians in chapter 3, For we are the true circumcision, that is, the true people of God, who worship God in spirit and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Paul says there are three marks to the true people of God, meaning those who are Christians. Not in order, because I want to come back to the first one. One, we glory in Christ Jesus. He is our focus. We are Christocentric. We glory in Jesus. That second, actually it's third, but second I'm going to mention, we put no confidence in the flesh. He particularly is addressing issues of it's not being circumcised as a Jew. It's not what we do externally, but rather what, you know, that we are what's internally. And the third one, the real point here, is that one of the marks of being a member of the true people of God is we worship God in spirit. <coughs> we worship God in spirit. I believe, and I'll go this far, if you are saved, you cannot help but worship. Martin Luther said, to have a God is to worship Him. If you are truly saved, you cannot help but worship, and if you do not worship, you cannot be saved. Because what does it mean to be saved? It means to be in relationship with God the Father by the sacrifice made by Jesus in order to bring us back in, in relationship with Him. That's what salvation is, to be reunited to our intended relationship with God the Father because of Jesus having paid the price and built the bridge so that we can once again access God the Father. If you do not worship God, meaning you have no intimacy with God, you have no connection with God, you do not seek Him, you do not have relationship with Him, you cannot be saved. Someone who never worships is not saved. I'm, I'm extrapolating a theological point there, but I believe that's true. Now, we may be pitiful in our worship, just like we may be pitiful in other, other disciplines, but if we never do it, then we have a foundational, fundamental problem with our spiritual life. And we better be aware of that. Okay? Does anybody want to call me on that? Or disagree? Cop agree? Whatever. So, the worship of God is one of the marks of us being a person of God, part of the people of God. We don't worship, we're not part of the group. Paul is very clear, I think, on that. And then, we need to see that worship is a corporate activity. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't worship, we can't seek intimacy with God on our own. We should. In fact, God commands us that when we're going to pray, go into your closet privately and pray. And the God who, who hears in private will answer you. But there's also an extent, again, forsake not the gathering of yourselves together. All the way through Scripture, there is a clear message that we should also worship God corporately as the body of Christ. Poor dear. So she's, she's struggling. She's really bad cold, and oh. she does, she coughs a lot. Okay. Um, for instance... Um, at that time, in Genesis 4, this is way early. At that time, men began to call on the name of the Lord. And the suggestion there in, that, in the context is that it was men together, men and women, but gathered in unity. Revelation 5 says, and I heard, this is John telling us, I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all therein saying, to him who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. By the way, that's a really good example of what it means to praise God, to exalt God. And the four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. Every creature joining together in voice to praise God. So, together in worship. It is a corporate activity. And we need to recognize that. That's not to say we can't, we shouldn't also do it privately. Especially that we should not have a... a private prayer life, but in its fullest expression, worship is done by the entire people of God, and especially the gathered people of God. Sorry, Joanne. Um, and this is very biblical, right? So, God commands our worship. He alone is to be worshipped. The worship of God is one of the marks that we are saved, that we are part of the saved people. And it is a corporate activity, not exclusively so, but um, particularly, as I say, the fullest expression of worship happens in a corporate setting. But it's also true that God is not pleased with all worship, or perhaps I should say with all things that we call worship. Not all worship is alike. Some of what we and others call worship 
is not acceptable to God. It's not all the same. Mark 7 says, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me. This is Jesus talking. That there is a kind of attempted worship that is vain, meaning useless, valueless, because it is done with our lips and not with our hearts. People who think... I show up for an hour on Sunday morning, I check that box, I attended church this week, my duty is done, I'm good. And the whole time they're here, all they're thinking about is, you know, whether or not the Cowboys are going to win this afternoon, or whatever else it might be. They, have, they are not seeking God, they are not approaching God, they are not growing in intimacy with God. That is the kind of worship that God does not find honoring. It is not acceptable to Him. Amos 5. The prophet Amos says, I hate, I despise your feasts. And we're talking here about various religious practices. And I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and cereal offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fatted beasts, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. If it's all just words... Or thinking, I showed up at the right place at the right time, and so therefore I fulfill my obligations. God very clearly tells us there is a kind of worship that is not acceptable to Him. If it's not really focused on Him, seeking Him. Doesn't matter what else you do. Doesn't matter that you brought the, you know, the, the, you put in a lot of money in the offering plate, or you sang with a full gusto and you're in great voice today, or whatever else it was. We can practice all the things and still not be acceptable to God in our worship. And David says in Psalm 51, Thou hast no delight in sacrifice. Were I to give a burnt offering, thou wouldst not be pleased. Remembering, this is how the, the Jews thought they should worship back then. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Do we come to him humbly, praising him and acknowledging his greatness, and not because we are worthy, but because he is merciful? That's the kind of worship we should have. Another passage, which was too long to put up here, from the prophet Isaiah, the first chapter. Isaiah says, What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings, of rams, and the fat of fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls, or of lambs, or of he goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. Remember, this is how they thought they were supposed to do church back then. Just the, because of the fact we don't do any of those particular things doesn't mean we're not falling into the same problems. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. You have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your doings from before my eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. That's Isaiah 1, 11 to 17. So often here, and you know, Jesus does the same thing in Matthew 25, which I'm preaching on these days. Um, that is, as much as you've done it, the least of these you've done it unto me, and those who have fed the hungry, given drink to the thirsty, clothed those who need clothing, uh, cared for the sick, visited those in prison, welcomed in the stranger. Those people, he says, enter into your uh, eternal reward prepared for you since the beginning. Those who call him Lord, but have not done those things, he says, depart from me. Into the lake of fire prepared for the devil and his demons, for I never knew you. So how we act is reflection. And I think that the, the real order of things is if we truly are worshiping, if we are seeking to serve God, rather, if we are seeking to worship God, if we are seeking to grow in intimacy with Him, that changes everything. And we will find ourselves caring for the widow and the oppressed and feeding the hungry and clothing those with needy clothing, etc. So, again, the, the critical key in so much of this is understanding right worship. Being in right relationship with God by seeking intimacy with Him. Lynn? Is that kind of in body, mind, and spirit? Because that is our totality. 
uh, comes together with our our God, our our spirit is connecting with our source, right? Uh, and so that we are in unity, and therefore God's caring for us is shown through all those things that we've been talking about. The, uh, the, the, the clothing, the feeding, the, the, the healing, uh, right. the, the service to humanity, because that is God acting through us. That is right. our, um, our, our main service. responsibility if we are in communion with God. Therefore, right. um, we praise God when we do those things. We don't do them because we have to. Right. And it's, the church has almost always seen service as the other side of the coin of worship. All right. If we are worshiping rightly, we will call the service. And you just said something I had not thought about this, but it's interesting. You said you know we are um, our body, mind, and spirit, our totality. You know, that, and that's why I think, by the way, that we are one of the key ways we don't talk about often that we're made in the image of God. You know, Jesus, the incarnate one, had a body. We have a body. God, the mind, is the controlling part. I think God, the Father, is the controlling part. And our spirit, the part of us that responds to things that are not cognitive. I think is a reflection of us being made in the image that is the Spirit of God. So all three of those. But something you said just sparked in me the, the thought that when we fail in understanding and practicing proper worship is in when we try to use only one part of ourselves. Exactly what I meant. That if we think just showing up and going through the steps, in effect we're saying, okay, I'm using my body, but my mind is somewhere else and my spirit certainly isn't. If we're only using our mind, you know, if we're sitting there rationally picking apart the sermon or the readings or why are we doing this or whatever, in other words, if we find ourselves in sort of a critical mindset for everything that's happening and we are not allowing our spirit to be responsive to God um, and, and we're saying, man, I'd love to get out of here, I'd love to remove my body from the setting, then we are not going to have the right worship. Or even if we, if we respond more emotionally, in other words, if we let ourselves get carried away with the emotion of it, but we are not... We're not being the theologically astute about what does this mean, and you know we're not. Then I think there's a danger there as well. You know, it's almost as that we can be too rational or we can be too emotional, and there's a tendency for the extremes of our various kinds of worship to do that. I think that that it is healthy when we incorporate all of who we are to reach for intimacy with God, and that that will result in an expression of service. I said in the last class talking about ethics. Um, Luther said, love God and do as you please. And I used it in the context of an ethical response. That is, if you truly love God, if that's the first thing you do, then what pleases you will be pleasing to God. That, that obe obedience to that first responsibility, that first duty of loving God, as Jesus commanded it, will lead us into all the rest of the right stuff. Love God and do as you please, as Luther said. Well, the same thing is true with regard to worship. If we're truly loving God, meaning seeking intimacy with Him, in relationship with Him, then what pleases us will be the things that are pleasing to God in service, in, you know, in right worship, in everything else in our lives. It'll all come together. We do not, if we do not worship, we cannot truly be saved. And if we do not worship, we will not have a right expression of all the rest of what it means to be a Christian in our life. Okay? Is that fair? I want to get into now worshiping in spirit and truth and some of what that means. But before I do that, why don't we go ahead and take our break now? In all of that... Are we seeking, pursuing greater intimacy with God? Knowing that it has to be spirit in the spirit, what we do with our bodies affects that. But we have to do it in the spirit and we have to do it in truth. We have to be honest about who we are. Every Sunday we have a prayer of confession. And included in the prayer of confession we have a brief moment where we invite everyone to confess their own private sins. Do we do that? Or do we just wait until somebody starts talking again? Okay. Um, we need to be true with who we are. Not like you're going to fool them anyway. You might as well go for it. All right. Any questions or comments about that? Yes? What about the praying in tongues? What about it? I mean, what's the question? Uh, well, there are churches when they say now, uh, well, there, many people pray out loud. In tongues. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, speaking in tongues is very clearly biblical mm -hmm. and very appropriate. Now, the question of how you do that in worship, I'm not a good person to ask because I've never been involved in planning a you know, worship service where there is the 
expression of the ecstatic gifts. There are other people here who have been involved in that, and they could probably speak to that better. Uh, certainly, I mean, when I said, you know, in what, the name, what's your question about tongues? <coughs> One, Paul makes it very clear that speaking in tongues, along with all the other gifts of the Spirit, the ecstatic and the less ecstatic of the gifts of the Spirit, are real. And anybody who says, well, no, they're not real anymore, you go, well, I'm sorry, what do you do with Paul? One of my New Testament uh, professors in seminary, who was a brilliant scholar and very well known, written a bunch of books, he insisted, as some people do, that the gifts of the Spirit were only for the New Testament times, as long as the apostles were alive, and when they died, the gifts of the Spirit died. I'm sorry, but I don't think so, because Paul goes to great length to educate the various churches in, in Galatia, even more so in Corinth, in Thessalonica, about the right use of the gifts of the Spirit. Well, if those things were only supposed to be around until all the apostles died, the apostles weren't in those places. Does that mean that the day that John the Apostle, the last of the apostles, died, the day that he died, everybody all of a sudden woke up and go, man, why don't we speak in tongues anymore? We don't seem to have any healing anymore. The gift of hospitality has just left us. I don't think so. That doesn't make any sense, right? And so I don't buy that, and therefore we believe the, the gifts of the Spirit, uh, all of them, are still real. It does not mean that everybody uses all the gifts of the Spirit. Now, uh, the Pentecostal movement and charismatic churches often will say that speaking in tongues is the primary mark, that it is the one that shows the Spirit is present. I believe Paul says that's not true. Paul says, do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Do all prophesy? Clearly the answer is no. He's asking rhetorical questions. Um, the reason why there are several instances in the New Testament when speaking in tongues is the sign and that particularly is when Cornelius and his family are converted, the first Gentiles we know of that were converted, when the, um, when the second chapter of Acts, the day of Pentecost, when the, the apostles are gathered together and everybody else is around and the Holy Spirit comes on them. In those cases, the sign of the Holy Spirit being present was speaking in tongues. And the reason is because that is the most obvious and visible, unequivocal sign of the Holy Spirit being present. If the Holy Spirit had come upon those people and all of a sudden they had had the gift of hospitality, it would not have been very obvious. Or even the gift of prophecy or the gift of speaking in tongues is not something you can mistake for something else. And so in those instances in the New Testament, um, in the book of Acts especially, where God wanted to make sure everybody around saw that the Spirit of God was there, speaking in tongues is the most obvious way to do that. That does not mean speaking in tongues is the only valid sign or that everyone has to speak in tongues. I believe Paul is very clear about that. That some will be given tongues, some interpretation, some prophecy, some administration, some help, some healing, some teaching, you know, there are various other gifts. Hospitality, I mean, the gift of helps, which is just as much a gift, is one that you may never see. They're the people who pick up the trash after a second Sunday and wash the dishes and etc. Um, and yet all of those are legitimate gifts of the Spirit. So, speaking in tongues, in terms of how you create a service and which tongues are used in a way that is still decently and in order, which is what Paul says, and it's in the context of speaking in tongues. He even says, one or two will speak in tongues, and then one or two will interpret. Not, you know, everybody make a line here on the left who wants to speak in tongues, or whatever. You know, it's, it's a very different kind of setting. Lynn? Yeah, um, I'm confused about why anybody would think that with the end of the Apostles' lifetime, it was the end of those gifts of the Spirit. Well, I think it's because you don't see, in most churches, in mainline churches at least, you do not see the expression of the ecstatic gifts. And sometimes you don't see the expression of gifts at all. Uh, and I think one of the reasons for that, we don't see a lot of healing these days. You know, some, but not a lot. We don't see a lot of speaking in tongues or prophesying, etc. Some of it's because you don't see something you're not looking for. Some of it is that I think we lack faith. And some of it is exactly what we're talking about. We, did, we no longer have a concept of worship, which is seeking intimacy with God. We've got a set way of doing it, and that's what we're going to do. And how dare anybody to suggest that there's speaking in tongues or anything else that's not part of the service. I honestly, as the, as the pastor, wouldn't, would not be sure how to incorporate that. But you really? just heard me say, I believe that tongues and the other gifts are very much a part of what God is doing, the Holy Spirit is doing in the world. And so, we'll see. Thank you. One of the things there's interpretation from the uh, where it says that the that these the, the gifts of the, the spirit will pass away, and the verb that's used is for a time, and, and it implies it will come back at some time in the future. And for and 
that's my understanding. And also, there's there's mentioned that as the end times approach uh, in prophecy, that there'll be a pouring out of the spirit. Well, how would you recognize what was a pouring out of the spirit if you hadn't seen what it right. had to be about? From Joel, etc. Yeah, Joel. Yeah, and the passage that says that uh, where there there are tongues, they will pass away is in First Corinthians 13. And the context there, he Paul is saying that anything that we express. Even if, it's, even if it's the Holy Spirit, anything that we express as physical beings, as human beings right now, all of those things are secondary in importance. Eventually, you know, we'll not be practicing those things, but compare that to love, which is the fundamental, the inherent nature of God that he gives to us. So he's putting it in the context of, compared to love, speaking in tongues is not a big deal. And that's very consistent. And when he says it will pass away, I don't interpret that, I don't understand that as being that all of the gifts of the Spirit will pass away. And I don't know anywhere else that it says that, you know, that it says the gifts will pass away. Um, was there another hand? Somebody else? Something? Okay. So, in terms of speaking in tongues, when I said, you know, what, the, what are you asking? Tongues are very valid. How you incorporate them in the service? Uh, I'll need to refer you to some of my charismatic or Pentecostal friends or ministers. Um, because there, there's, a, there's a right way to do that. And I, but I haven't experienced it. Yes? So, it will be necessary and interpret. Someone speaking and someone interpreting? Paul said that, he, he, that if someone is to speak in tongues, someone must interpret. Some people apparently have the gift of tongues and the gift of interpretation. Paul says that if you speak in tongues, only do so if there is somebody to interpret. Because Paul said, better to speak five words somebody can understand in the body, in the church, than 10,000 words nobody can understand. He says it, and I think I've, I have charismatic friends who talk about having a prayer language that they find very satisfying in their own prayer life at home, you know, in private. And I think Paul is suggesting that, that if you have the gifts of tongue and you use it for a personal, a private prayer language, and that for you is spiritually very fulfilling as the Spirit speaks through you, do that at home. Don't expect to do that in a church service unless there's somebody to interpret, because you're not doing other people any good if you're just doing it because you find spiritual satisfaction in it. Okay? Yes? I, I attended a charismatic church, and, and the way it was done there would be that the service would go on, and somebody just spontaneously would stand up and start to speak in tongues. And the whole service would shut down and an interpreter would start to interpret. And if, they, and if the person didn't have an interpreter, they would, they would be requested to, to cease and desist. Okay. That's the way it was done. Yeah, and I, I'm sure that there's a, an orderly way to do that. I would find that very disconcerting as the person responsible for, <laughs> for the service myself. But, you know, uh, we'll see. Now, I, I once went to a, a meeting of cult. <laughs> um, and I did this because I graduated from college and was still there and I was uh, one of the leaders in our local Christian fellowship group. And The Way International, do you know The Way? Um, Roland Paul Werewell or something, anyway. Um, and it is a cult. And they came on campus and they were having these meetings. And one of the characteristics is that they are very, very authoritarian, very controlled. And in this meeting, the guy who was leading it, and I, at one point I said, you know, um, can I ask a question? And he said, we'll get to you later. <laughs> and after, after everything was done and he told everybody, we're finished, you can go away, then he wanted to deal with me one-on-one. -on -one. He didn't want me to ask any questions for anybody else. Well, one of the things he did is said, uh, he would say, okay, Chris, speak in tongues. Uh, okay, Kina, interpret. And they did that for like two or three people, and then went on. I mean, it's very centrally oriented, very, and not biblical, as far as I can tell. Um, but, yeah, so there's different ways of doing it. That's not the way to do it. I don't think that's biblical at all. Okay. Anything else about any of that? Yes? It's just been my experience when I've gone on missions. <clears throat> it was much easier to see God at work, to see the, all the miracles. I personally, being in, you know, the affluent U.S. of A., it's it's harder. Yeah. It's harder. I mean, there's we have so much. It's very hard. I was just I don't have to read everyone go on missions. Yeah, that's very true. And other parts of the world, um, <clears throat> the, especially the developing parts of the world, are much more open to spiritual things. People in Africa and even parts of Asia that sort of assume the spiritual is real, they're very open to you talking to them about God who came to Earth as His Son. They're going, "Wow, cool! Tell me more about this." Not like, oh, come on, give me a break, which is the way most, most Westerners would respond to that. 
And because of that, I think they're very much more open to the more dynamic, miraculous, ecstatic kind of expressions of God in the spirit um, than we are. We're talking about people who, you know, I've known people from South Korea, and they'd get together for prayer meeting, they go all night, and that was just normal. In Africa, you go to a service, and you're going to be there four hours. And because that's the point, is worshiping God, and, and celebrating God, and being in communion with Him. Here, I go an hour and five minutes, and somebody's going to complain to me. You know, you've got to stop in time. Uh, and I go, I'll stop when I feel God is telling me to stop. It's not like I'm going for two hours or three hours and somebody's missing their football game. But, but you get the idea. And, and I think one of the reasons is because their focus, their orientation in developing parts of the world especially is so different than ours. They leave room for God to be more active than we do. We don't have any room for that. We've got other stuff to do. We've got to go on. You know? we, can't, we can't stop for an expression of the Holy Spirit. We've got stuff to do. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm exaggerating here, but I really think that there's some, some of it is really true. Okay? All right. So now I want to get to the part about liturgy and worship. Um, with the exception of liturgical elements that suggest wrong doctrine, and there are some, like Chris speak in tongues, keen to interpret, I, don't, I think that's wrong doctrine. I think that's, you know, that's not appropriate. As, and liturgy is simply the, the elements that you have as part of your worship service. You know, what are the structured elements? I don't want to go so far as to say the program, as, you know, as Tozer talked about, but the idea of the elements. You know, in our church, we have an initial welcome, and we do the announcements to start off, and for me, for me, the announcements are not just gotta get this out of the way. I want it to be a time for people, to make people feel comfortable. I try to be lighthearted about it. I, you know, kind of make jokes. I'll make jokes about myself, uh, you know, and I'll, and so we, in order for us to feel like, hey, this is an okay place for me to be. And, but then we will have the prayer of adoration uh, and invocation where we invite God to be present with us and we turn our hearts to him. And then we go into the various elements, which include, you know, uh, songs of praise. It includes the prayer of confession uh, that is led by someone. And there's a time in there for everyone to confess their own private sins. There's, there are readings of scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, gospel, and then we use the responsive reading for, for a, a psalm or proverbs, sometimes use other things, but primarily that. Um, the reading of the creeds, we do twice a month, communion once a month, you know, so we have these various elements, and those are the liturgical elements, the pieces. But if some church has some liturgical element that actually is based upon wrong doctrine, then that's a problem. But apart from that, there are no inherently right or wrong liturgical elements. I, I went through for you all of the different um, kinds of church traditions, from the New England Puritan to the Revivalist to the, to the Free Church, which is mainline Protestant nowadays, etc. They all have different elements. They all have different order of things. None of them are right or wrong. None of them are inherently better or worse than any other. It is, to what extent are they effective in leading us to the place we need to be in worship? And that is in recognizing and being in communion with God and pursuing intimacy with God. So, the issue is not emotional or not emotional hymns, extraneous or red prayer, sorry, extemporaneous or red prayers, congregational responses or silence. It is not the difference between Anglican, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist, Congregationalist, or Quaker liturgies, but rather how effective the service turns the worshiper's attention to God. And different communities, I believe that there is a purpose behind having different denominations. It doesn't mean they're all right about everything. I'm sorry, Baptist, but I believe sprinkling is fine when it comes to baptism. Um, and so, yeah, th there are differences, and some may be more correct than others. I've often said, especially with my Catholic friends, that I expect when we get to heaven there will be a whole lot of forehead slapping going on, which means, how did I miss that? Why didn't I understand that? Why didn't I see that at the time? Okay, we're all going to be, and we have to have some humility. Right? We're all going to recognize that we maybe didn't get something perfectly right. But apart from something that actually is doctrinally incorrect or theologically on the wrong track, various kinds of denomination, various kinds of worship services, I think, are appropriate 
because people find different things satisfying. Some people like rock and roll, some people like classical, some people like, as they used to say in the South, both kinds of music, country and western. So, in the same way, people are moved by different kinds of worship services. And when I say moved, I don't just mean made emotional. I mean different approaches to worship can facilitate different people's efforts to recognize the presence of God and come into intimacy with Him. There is no one right and no one wrong as long as it's not theologically off, off track or off base. All right? Now, I, I think that, that the revivalist movement, for instance, I think that there are times when we do need to call people to salvation. But if we do that every week, then we're leaving out all of the people who are already saved and need to grow in their faith that need a focus to be on how discipleship, not just evangelism. There, you know, there are both. And some of the, the seeker-oriented churches, some of the uh, revivalism-oriented churches, and the seeker churches kind of came out of that, um, they're so focused on new people that I think sometimes that the, the ongoing Christian believers are not being fed or not being grown in their faith because they're not being given enough attention. I think there has to be a balance in there. We probably could, could move more toward more of the revivalist kind of uh, invitation. I don't do that that often. I think, I hope, you know, our services and our messages make it clear to those. And in fact, I know there are uh, several people that are good friends of mine who have become Christians in our church. They weren't believers before. And so, it's happening. Maybe I should, you know, we should focus on that more. And I especially as the pastor. I, I confess that. I acknowledge that. But there's no one right way or wrong way. And particularly... When we get too hung up on one way of doing it, inherent in that hang-up, inherent in that focus, is almost the assurance that we're not going to experience God the way we should. And C.S. Lewis does a brilliant job of explaining this, um, talking about liturgy. Okay. C.S. Lewis, sorry, he's cut off. Lewis said, as long as you notice and have to count the steps, you're not yet dancing, but only learning to dance. A good shoe is a shoe you don't notice. Good reading becomes possible when you need not consciously think about eyes or light or print or spelling. The perfect church service would be one we were almost unaware of. Our attention would have been on God. You get that? As long as we're worried about the next element in the program, to use Tozer's word, as long as we're worried about, well, are we doing enough you know, worshiping in song, are we, you know, maybe we shouldn't be doing the confession. If we're worrying about that stuff, if we're focused on the elements of the liturgy too much, then maybe the problem is we're focusing on that so much we're not allowing God to speak to us. We're thinking too much about how you dance instead of dancing. Now, um, Lewis also said the one thing that he, he believed many different kinds of liturgy would be good, but he said the one thing that he felt was critically important was uniformity, meaning that we weren't always trying to do something new and different, that we weren't always trying to have novelty in our worship service. And the reason for that, very simply, is that when we're always trying to have novelty, when we're trying to do something different, you know, in, you know interject new kinds of elements or aspects to our worship, then what happens is it draws attention to that thing that people aren't used to and actually prevents them from being comfortable in seeking God. I, recognizing there are other things we can be doing in worship, I am always really, every time I start thinking about changing something in our worship, I'm really concerned that if we begin to modify things, that becomes a hang-up for people. They start noticing, oh, that's different than we've done it before. Well, how are they relating to God, if that's the issue? It doesn't mean we shouldn't ever change things, but if... There are some places they feel like every week it's like a variety show. They've got to come up with something different in order to keep people involved and interested. And in fact, in doing so, they're causing people to focus on the novelty or the differences in the worship that week from what they've been used to. And therefore, the focus is on the elements of liturgy, not upon God. And so for the most part, and this is what Lewis advocated, is you don't want to have novelty. You want to have uniformity. That there needs to be a really, really good reason why you might change something, either add or subtract something, and then don't do so on a whim and don't do so, you know, often. And I agree with that. What do you guys think? Yeah. Do, do I agree? Growing up as a loser, I used to think, oh my gosh, you know, da, 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 every week the same thing. But you know, as an adult, <clears throat> I look back on that very fondly. I mean, with 
with reverence to God. Yeah. You go, oh my gosh. I mean, it's like, well, I really missed it then. But it was preparation. I mean, it, it, it did prepare me for when there were hard times. I knew where I could go. Right. So I think it is important. Yeah. And I have known, you know, I, I, I've known people, particularly in the Anglican tradition, I actually attended an Episcopal church for a while. Um, I'm not real keen on the American Episcopal Church, but I like the Anglicans, <laughs> which is the Anglican communion worldwide is much more evangelical um, than, than the Episcopal Church in America, which is very liberal, and they've really fallen off, you know, they've gone off the tracks as far as I can tell. Um, the yeah, people who have gone, like I read an account of one, one young woman who'd grown up in the Episcopal Church, and she'd gone, you know, folks had taken to church every Sunday her whole life. And she was so bored with this. And then she, like college age, she got saved. And she said, the first time I went back to the Episcopal Church and I heard and I participated in the liturgy, she said it was the same words I had been saying and hearing my whole life. But she said, my eyes were opened. And I said to myself, have I been saying these wonderful things my whole life and didn't even realize it? Because the things that may seem like sort of rote, just repetition, and it becomes not meaningful, until our eyes are open spiritually, until the Holy Spirit speaks to us and we, you know, we have a saving experience in Jesus Christ, we, we're not going to be able to get that. You know, Paul said that, that the things of God are a kind of folly to those that are not saved. Well, the same thing is true with some liturgy. It's a kind of folly. It doesn't make any sense. We think it's just, you know, my brother said one time, uh, oh yeah, those churches that just repeat the same thing every, every week, they... People just say it uh, out of boredom, and they don't really. It doesn't mean anything. And, don't, and, and, I, and I thought, you really don't get it. That for many people, that's a, the the fact they know these words, and they're able to share them every week with the people around them. That's the thing that brings them the greatest spiritual commitment, and that's the thing that brings them the greatest comfort. There is great strength in that. But you first have to have the spiritual eyesight to be able to see that, or else it just sounds like you're repeating the same words meaninglessly, it's just hollow every week, okay? All right, I want to come back a little bit more to worshiping the Spirit and the truth, and I think I've dealt with some of this already. Um, first, we must approach God truthfully, that is, honestly and wholeheartedly. Mark 7, the people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me. We need to be honest with God. We need to not pretend to worship. If you really, for whatever reason, aren't able to worship, then sit there quietly, don't pretend. And there are times when we're struggling or, you know, our mind and heart is so much somewhere else. Now, usually that's exactly when we do need to seek God. But there may be times, don't pretend, you know, don't put on a, a, a facade for the people around you. Certainly don't put on a facade for God because he's going to know. Um, secondly, we must worship based on the principles and teaching of the Bible. John 17, Jesus in the high priestly prayer, which should have been called the Lord's Prayer, but that was already taken. Uh, John 17 is where Jesus prays prior to uh, his, his sacrifice and then eventual resurrection and ascension. Jesus says, ask God the Father to sanctify them, which is the apostles, and us. It's in the same prayer that he says, I pray not only for them, but for those who will be saved because of their words. That's us. Jesus was praying for us. We are saved because of the words of the apostles. Sanctify them by the truth that your word is truth. We find the truth in God's word. And that's why there needs to be a very clear biblical orientation to how we worship. And then third, we need to approach God in truth, which means that we have Jesus as our focus. Again, the theological word is Christocentric. Jesus at the center. Um, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. If worship is to come to the Father to respond to his call, and to come to him, and seek intimacy with him. The only way we can do that is in Jesus Christ. There is no way, no one comes to the Father but by Jesus. The Holy Spirit must call us, we must respond, and our response must be to Jesus. And by Jesus, we are able to be in a relationship with the Father. So worship requires the Spirit to call us and our relationship with Jesus. So our worship has to be Christocentric. It has to be focused on Jesus. Um, or else, we are not really going to be able to approach God. There is no other way to come to God except through Christ. And we must be truthful 
in our acceptance of Christ and in our worship. There are people who pretend to worship all the time because it's expected of them who don't even know Jesus, who can't be in relationship with God the Father without Jesus. Without Him, we are still creatures of sin and God cannot look on us. So our worship with Him must be because of Jesus and what He made possible. Questions or comments about that? Yes? There are times though I think people come to church because they are so heavy hearted, they don't I don't know how to phrase this, um, they can't they can't find a way to approach God. But being around other godly people can at least lift them up. Comfort them. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I mean my, yeah. my personal experience when my husband died, I just grief is so intense. I had to be in church, but I couldn't talk to God. Yep. Well, and I think that's fine. What we're saying here is don't pretend. And in fact, I said, if you come to church and for whatever reason you don't feel you can worship, then don't pretend to be worshiping. Simply be there and present yourself silently in the presence of God and say, do with me what you will. But don't come and sort of sing the songs and try to put a smile on your face and act like everything's okay when it's not. Don't, don't act something you're not really feeling. That's, that's what I mean by being true. But I fully understand the fact that sometimes, in fact, um, in Romans, Paul says that there are times when we don't even know how to pray, but the Holy Spirit can pray through us in, in, with meaning that's deeper than words. In other words, when we can't find the words, if we simply present ourselves to God and say, I'm here, and that's all I can really do right now. God will bless that. God will honor that. Rather than us come and say, I'd like to give a testimony and make something up when you're not really feeling it. That's not truthful. But that doesn't mean you always have to be at a certain place before you come to service or before you come before God. God, God not only gives us permission for that, He wants us to, to come to Him in that. Okay, is that fair? Mm -hmm. Lynn? Talking about faith and coming to God, when my husband died, very suddenly and unexpectedly and quite young, I could not come to church. I just could not. Um, yeah. Normal structure, all those things were just like jail bars. I couldn't even imagine. But I certainly did talk to God constantly. Um, and mostly, I'm so confused. Yeah. And, you know, here I am uh, five years later. Um, Still confused, but um, that's my, <laughs> my uh, role in life, I think, is to be asking <laughs> questions and to uh, try and clarify uh, confusion that I might have or that I perceive others have, um, that um, God has done a lot of work through me, mm -hmm. uh, but I have become closer to God and have um, a better communication with him than I had before because before life was pretty great yeah. and you know I didn't have a lot of bumps and bruises from that way and since then I've had some harsh realities presented to me as you know dummy I've been telling you and you just didn't get it so um, bump into the wall again and yeah. finally open your eyes and see right and the whole point there is are we telling the truth Exactly. And I'll give you a, a small but practical example. When we were, Carol and I were just in uh, San Antonio, we'd ordered a bunch of stuff, some of it like a printer, so we'll have a printer for the church because I'm exchanging them, and, and, and a lot of things for us and some things for the church, etc., some things for other people. And it was a huge amount of stuff. And on Tuesday, I was driving along and my car did something weird. It's like, I got the little symbol on there, like the, you know, the, it was kicking into, I don't know what it's called, it's not automatic, it's not the ABS system, but it's got a, a steering control thing that happens when it's on, on slippery you know, things, and it's a little symbol like a car with skidding. It did that, and it wouldn't accelerate. It's like all I could do to get off the road, turn it off, and turn it back on, it was working right. So here, we got a 14-hour drive. We had all of this stuff, which the bellman later said, I, I did not believe you could get all that in your car. Um, Realizing I was really tired and I had a 14-hour drive ahead of me, 
I was feeling um, it, this sort of ominous feeling. You know, it's like something is about to go wrong. You know, this this um, forlorn kind of uh, waiting for the shoe to drop kind of thing. Well, I'm a pastor. I'm a theologian. I'm not supposed to have that kind of stuff, right? <laughs> So well, that's I could have famous question. What's this all about? Yeah. So I, I could have just you know put a good face on it, but instead I said to God and I said to Carolyn, I'm feeling this sort of foreboding is the word I use, as though something's going to go wrong. Whether it's the car's not going to get us where we need to go, or you know just going to die in a pile on the way driving 14 hours, or whether we're not going to be able to get all the stuff in the car. Or whether they're going to stop us at the border, you know, and we're going to be there for eight hours and they're going to, you know, take the car away from us because we're bringing all this stuff to Mexico. None of it was electronics and stuff, with the exception of one printer, um, and et cetera. And so this sense of foreboding. But instead of trying to just sort of put on a happy face and say, you know, I'm a pastor, I'm a theologian, nothing could be wrong, everything's fine. I said, Lord, I'm feeling this sense of foreboding. And I know you're in charge and I know everything is going to be fine. But... In other words, I was honest about what I was feeling and asked for him to help me with that. And I confessed it to Carolyn. And I said, you know, I want us to pray about this. Um, so, there's always a temptation for us, wherever we are, to try to make like there's not really a problem. I don't have any problems. Everything's fine. No, I am feeling really crappy. Whether it's a major issue like the loss of a spouse, which, you know, mine is nothing compared to that. But even something as small as, am I going to be able to get all this stuff in the car? Am I going to have trouble at the border? And we had no trouble at all. We didn't, use, didn't have to slow down. Nobody checked our passports. Nobody, you know, we got the green light. We drove on through. Everything is fine. And again, if I had had anything like a TV or something like that, we, we declared it and stopped to pay duty. But stuff wasn't that expensive. It wasn't, we didn't exceed the expense amount or anything else. But it could have been a problem if they stopped us. We didn't have any problems with the car, despite what had happened on Tuesday, and so everything was fine. And I had no reason to worry about it, but the fact is, that feeling of foreboding that I had, I didn't try to just blow it off or pretend it wasn't there. I confessed it to God, I confessed it to Carolyn, I prayed about it. Um, are we being honest with God? He knows what we're feeling. He knows what we're going through. Whether it is a huge thing, or it's something that you can't even really put your finger on. True worship, Right relationship with God is being completely truthful about all of that. Because he knows anyway. Might as well tell him. Okay? Yes? And you know, that's why little children, kids are so charming. Yeah. Because they're very transparent. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. They have no guile. There is no sense. Guile, to me, guile means trying to pretend something you're not. Um, so. Well, I, I said, in talking about liturgy, and then we came back to worshiping in spirit and truth, one of the things we need to recognize, I'll spend just a few more minutes talking about this, is when we talk about worship being us, God calling us, us responding to Him, and that we're pursuing intimacy with God, one of, the, one of the things that we have to ask, that we need to be challenged by, is in what, how does God show up when we worship as a group, corporately? Where is God present? We don't have icons that we can say, you know, that we can focus our attention on. Is it the cross? Is it the words being spoken? Is it the person reading them or speaking them? What is it? Well, I think that, that historically we need to understand that um, God shows up primarily in the, the narrative of Scripture, especially the narrative of how, what Jesus did for us in the Jesus story. That's why it's Christocentric, you know, that Jesus is the focus. God is present in our understanding and of our retelling of the narrative of what he has done from the creation to the birth of the church. And especially, most especially, the narrative about Jesus, of the incarnation, of the sacrifice of Jesus, of the atonement that occurred, that was proven in the resurrection and the ascension. But all of the different pieces as long as, as we have the right attitude, the right spirit about them, all the different pieces of things we practice in the worship services as liturgy can reflect that narrative. It can reflect the, the Christ story. Our prayers, our praise, our reading of Scripture and hearing of Scripture, our partaking in the sacraments, the, all of the different practices of worship 
if, our, if we are seeking God in them, those are the places that God shows up, so to speak. Because they are the things that are our physical representations, and even more than representations. We are, we are in all of those things that we do, if we, if we have the right spirit about them, they are the places in which we're inviting God to be present. God, hear our confessions and forgive us. God, we share the word that you gave us. Speak to us through that word. You know, um, all of the different pieces. Lord, we sing these songs in praise to you. Hear them, may they be a delight to you and make us be aware of your presence. So in those various pieces of the liturgy, God actually shows up if our spirit is right and if we invite him. And when I say if our spirit is right, if we do these things in faith and in expectation, the same thing is true when we have communion. And the words that I use, in the words of institution, um, are, and as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup in faith, in faith being the important part, in other words, if our spirit is in it, just eating a little piece of bread and drinking a cup of grape juice is not going to do anything for you unless you come to it in faith and in expectation, in very real memory of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, and in expectation and anticipation of what he will do. If we bring that to the table, then God is there for us in a very real way. We don't have to believe that it physically transforms into the very literal flesh and blood of Jesus as the Catholic Church maintains in transubstantiation. It doesn't have to literally change. If we come to it in faith, we take it in faith, it is for us the very body and blood of Jesus Christ until he comes again. So those elements of the liturgy are important, not just because we physically do something, but because as we come in faith to those things, they, they take on a mystical reality in which God is present to us in those things. That's why we do them. And if we don't have a sense of that, then we shouldn't be doing those things. We should find something else to do. Does that make sense? So every one of those pieces can be a place where we meet God. In confession, in hearing his word, in singing his praise, in uh, sharing together in, in a antiphonal, in a responsive reading of the great messages of worship and praise that we have in uh, Psalm and Proverbs. All the other pieces, we can meet God there. But we have to come to it in faith, in expectation, in seeking God and intimacy with Him in those things. So when we just go through the steps, when it's just a program, that's when it's not real worship. But all of those pieces that some people may think of just as the program can really be mystical places that we meet God in our worship on an ongoing basis if we have the right spirit and the right approach to it. Okay? So liturgy is important. Um, the, the, what would otherwise be very ordinary experiences are places to meet God if we come to them correctly. Right? Um, any questions or comments about that? Yes? I have a comment, or a question, actually. Um, I think it was the first class you uh, made a comment about the difference between corporate and individual worship mm -hmm. and that in historically people would not have really understood the idea of individual worship, that they saw it as corporate. Right. Um, can you elaborate a little bit uh, more on this this uh, corporate worship, I guess? I, I think growing up in the individualistic era, I have a more, um, I can connect with that more. Mm -hmm my individual connecting with God. And that's not to say that I do not believe that we should forsake the gathering together. I get that. Right. But um, I'm still a little fuzzy okay. on, on corporate worship and, and the part that it plays historically and what it should, the value, I guess, that it should have to us today. Right. Um, yeah, I think that you've hit the nail on the head in that it is our hyper-individualistic culture here at the start of the 21st century you know, that developed really in the last 100 years. I mean, actually, more recently than that, the last 50 years, 60 years. That leads us to believe that our relationship with God is just a private thing. Now, it is a personal thing, but it's not a private thing. I am saved by, by, my, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in me and of my receiving in faith 
You know, by grace you are saved through faith. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Ephesians 2 8. And so, yes, I privately and personally am saved. But the church, from the very start, never had a concept of somebody having a private faith. It may be a personal faith, but, I mean, give me one example in the New Testament where anyone was solitary in their expression of faith. Even John, when he was on the Isle of Patmos, had a secretary. You know, there was somebody else there he shared the faith with. Paul, when he's in prison, he and Silas are singing songs together. They're witnessing to other prisoners. This idea of one person, you know, it's me and you, God. Don't need anybody else. It is me and God as I accept Jesus. It is personal salvation, but it is never a private thing. The church has never understood that from the very start. The, you know, the, Jesus, when he went off, he would take three of the others with him, at least. Often he took twelve. When the church began meeting, they would gather together. We have the description in Acts. They would gather in homes. They would share meals together. They would listen to the teaching. We don't have any accounts in the New Testament of anybody going off and practicing their spirituality by themselves. It doesn't exist. And yet we've gotten so individualistic. I mean, people will say things like, I don't need the church. I don't have anything to do with the church. It's me and Jesus, and I will do this at home by myself, and I'll be much happier with that. Really? And where in Scripture do you find that being a model for you to follow? We have the model of us being in communion. In fact, in our church, when we have communion, the Eucharist, the Thanksgiving, um, when we share the, the body and blood of Christ, we do something, and that is when somebody comes around, we tell them to take the bread, because they come up front, we serve in the front. They, we say, take the bread and uh, consume it immediately as a sign of your personal relationship with Jesus Christ in faith. But take the cup back to your seat, and once everyone has been served, we will all drink of the cup together because this is communion, as the same root word as community. We will do that because we are together the body of Christ. By myself, I'm not the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. And so we drink of, at the end, I will say the gifts of God for the people of God, take and eat on them in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. And we all drink of the cup together. We do that as a group because we are together the body of Christ. And so we recognize both the personal salvation, but the fact it's not private, it is a corporate thing. So it is a very recent invention, this idea of solitary Christianity. I mean, the only, the only exception that's ever been conceived of is if somebody really was isolated on a desert island by themselves, and God would miraculously uniquely bless them in some way to be able to commune with him. But other, other than that, the whole model we have in the New Testament and throughout the whole history of the church with the single exception of the, um, of the hermetic uh, monastic traditions, have been, that we, and, and those were seen as very unique calling. You know, those were very different. Not everybody was called to that. Even the monks and nuns who were called to the desert, the vast majority of them were called into community. You know, they're in a monastery together. So it was a very rare and very specialized kind of calling that someone was called to live a solitary life as part of their Christian life. So, I hope that answers your question. Well, okay, as you were answering the question, you talked about, you know, um, John being on the island of Patmos and having a uh, secretary. At least one other person and, we know of. Okay, so the Bible talks about where two or more gathered in my name. Um, is this corporate? Two or more, or is corporate this? Well, it's both. I mean, two or more means that's the minimum. It's not the maximum. Okay. Well, I think the reason I, I think I get confused with this too is because some churches are so wrapped up in what they're doing that there is no time to a lot to have a two or more. It's always what we're doing within these walls. Right. And, and so I think that perhaps in my mind I'm getting a little bit confused with, um, or maybe it's getting a little bit murky, the idea of, you know, going to the church building and attending the Sunday service and the Wednesday service or whatever, as opposed to gathering together in a fellowship of common believers. Right. Every church, every Christian should be involved in, in three, at least three kinds 
of worship activities. One is personal devotions. Okay, everyone should be reading scripture and praying and have a personal devotional life. Secondly, everyone should be involved in some sort of small group activity. It can be two people or three people. In our church, we really advocate that people belong to community groups. And those groups tend to be from 5 to 14. And it just depends upon the group and, you know, etc. That's a, that's a place where we become more family to each other, where there's a greater intimacy. than, than And then third is the, the gathering together of the body, the corporate worship. So, one-on-one, -on -one, me and God, devotional lives, the small group kind of setting, or community group as we call them, and third, the corporate worship. I think that we are called to have all three of those. And I think that we find that modeled in, in, well, in Jesus. Jesus had a personal relationship with God the Father. He had a specially close relationship with three others, Peter, James, and John. They went with him everywhere. They went with him to the Mount of Transfiguration. They went with him to the Garden of Gethsemane. They were his small group, so to speak. But then there was the larger group of all those who were not only the 12, uh, and you could say maybe that was his small group as well, but, but all of those who were following him, who were his disciples. The difference in apostle and disciple. Apostle is one who's sent out, a disciple is one who's called. And so Jesus practiced all, all three of those. You know, a personal relationship with God, and he practiced in devotions. He would go off by himself to pray. An intimacy with a smaller group of people, and then the gathering together of a corporate kind of thing. And we see that reflected down through the history of the church. The rare exceptions being the hermetic monastic orders, but that was always very rare. Far fewer even monks and nuns were called to that than were called to monastic communal life. So all three of those are valid. The tendency we have is... People who think it's just, you know, me and God and I don't really need anybody else, which is not biblical and it's, it's not historic. Or people who think, well, I show up at church on Sunday, why, should I have, why do I need to have a personal devotional life? I listen to preaching every week. Or why do I need to be involved in a small group? Well, because you can't get that sense of family, of interaction with 100 people or 200 people or 500 people or 5,000 people that you can with 5 or 8 or 12. And so we need that. We need all three of those. Individual, small group or community group, and corporate. Fair? But the idea that I can do it all on my own is not biblical. And I don't believe that's honoring to God. That reflects a kind of individuality that's really selfish. And yet too many people think that in our modern world. Chris? I agree with that. Having said that. No. I agree, but <laughs> no, I do agree with that. But I think too that like the, the right, like a relationship with the Lord, a intimacy with the Lord, um, while it needs to be nurtured at all within a community, I think you know it has to also be nurtured individually. Yeah. I mean, in other words, like like the beginning, you said, you know, if you don't worship, you're not saved. And I agree. But I think it's, it doesn't mean to me if you just come to church and that's when you worship, and then that's it. And then, well, then I'm not so sure you're saved just because you worship communally. I think it has to. It's, a, it's really a thing of the heart, obviously. Yeah, and I agree with you. That's why I say that there, you know, there's three kinds of relationships yeah, yeah, we need to have: yeah. individual, small group, you know, uh, and then corporate. And in fact, when we come together in corporate worship, we we may together be acknowledging God's presence, we may together be praising God, but when we're talking about coming into intimacy, a group doesn't come into intimacy with God. Each of us individually are called that. We can do so in the presence of others and have the blessing and benefit of that corporate event, but to, to come into greater intimacy with God is something that I have to do, and I, and I believe I need to do so myself with my own time of prayer and devotions. Uh, I need to do so in the in the sense of praying together with a smaller group of people and sharing our hurts and our needs and our, our victories with each other. And I need to do it in the presence of a large group so that together we can say, Lord, here we are. Bless us with your presence. We need all three of those. And the lack of any of them can cripple us. I mean, it is possible for someone to make the decision that I'm going to have a relationship with God and I'm going to do it all by myself. And they will be lame in their spiritual life. They may survive. But they will not be able to be as successful, to, to run as far, to be as, you know, to do as much as they could if they also were involved in corporate. Yes? I think you can say that periodically in your service. The three questions. Yeah. 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 Y
Yeah. <coughs> I'm actually I, thinking of doing a whole series of sermons about worship and talk about those things. Yeah. Yes, as I think many people don't get that. Well, I think that's very interesting, the way that you divided that up. And I think that the use of the word small group, a lot of churches say, well, we've got small groups. That doesn't necessarily mean you're connecting with those people that you've been assigned with or whatever. But we personally have a group of other missionaries that we hang around with that are all believers that is sort of a, a community or small group, if you will. Right. Um, I get that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can get that. Yeah, and that's why we call it community groups, because within that group we develop a sense of community that you can't get by yourself for sure, and you can't get with a hundred other people. You know, there's only so much you can do. And we don't call them small groups because to me that... You know, that doesn't really have any, there's no content of meaning in that. Mm -hmm. All you, that's, that's a quantitative definition. It's not any community group. And we actually had one group um, who had trouble with that name, the community group, because they said, you know, we're not, we're not trying to do outreach to the community. We're about ourselves. We want to be called a small group. And I said, no, no, no. You're using community in the wrong way. We're not talking about community group in the sense that you're trying to reach out to the community, although some groups, like ours, we have people come in from outside. We're structured in a way that we can have an ebb and flow, that people who are visiting can come to us, and it's all good. I mean, we're very Christian, and we, we, you know, we pray. The prayer time is the most significant thing that we do. But no, community group is because we together are community to each other, not because we're reaching out to the community. But again, small group means nothing to me because all that is is a, that's a quantitative definition. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because we are community, um, like I belong to a community group before I was associated with Church Tom. Right. Um, and did the group reach out to me? Well, they were loving and caring and genuine and uh, very human. We, we laughed a lot, we cried a lot, we shared food, we shared prayer. We shared our genuine selves, whatever that means to any particular individual. Um, so, yes, we were community because we were in communion with each other. Right. And that was not limited to any particular set of barriers. We also had right. uh, strangers who come and say, no, not for me. We have visitors to our families who say, I'd like to find out what this is all about because it's really affected you in a positive way. Right. And that is a wonderful thing when community means more than just the literal definition right. of, of the word. You know, it's, it's an active living thing. Right, and given our current attendance in church, more than half the people who come to our church are in community groups. We'd like for that to be 99.9%, .9%, but um, we want to increase that. The only reason we haven't grown more than that is because the groups that we had leadership for, we had maxed out. You know, some of us were bigger than we really should have been, and so we just now have three new groups that are starting, so that we'll have more opportunity for people to do that, because I think that's really important. Um, and so we'll, you know, we'll continue to do that. And it's hard. See, that's the thing, is we've had the experience, you know, there was, um, there was someone who, a couple who was attending a group, and she just froze my blood by some of the things that she would say. Um, that's all I can tell you. I mean, she, she was so focused on negative stuff, I finally one day had to say, I'm sorry, but we really don't want to hear that. You know, I mean, she would just, she would, it's like rubbing a sore tooth. She would dwell on things that were, you know, I, the, the night I said that to her, she said, oh, I was reading about this beautiful little blonde girl and her parents abused her and you know, she's going on and on and on. And I said, I'm sorry, but I don't want to hear that. And I don't think other people do either. Because she was always having some horrible, morbid, dark story that didn't have anything to do with her. It's something she read. And, mm -hmm. and so it's hard. I mean, you run into, people are, well, we're all broken. We all have our problems. And it's not easy to know how to deal with that kind of thing. But you do, because that's what family does. And we really are family. So thank you, everybody. 